Thanks for coming. Today we're going to be talking about making choices. There's a lot of information out there about making choices about what programming language to use or what, what framework to pick for your next project. But we're here at RailsConf, so I'm going to assume that's a solved problem for everyone in the room. We're going to talk about some choices you might make on a day-to-day -day basis in your job just trying to push tickets to the system. And we'll start with an example. Let's consider I'm asking you to join two pieces of wood together. There's a couple of screws already started in there and you have a hammer and a screwdriver available to you. So a little audience participation. By show of hands, who just knows which option they would choose? It doesn't matter which, but just I know which one I would use. Okay, great, wonderful. I'm gonna change it slightly now and take that screwdriver away and give you a brick. Uh, again, who knows which option they would choose? Awesome, cool. One last scenario. I'm gonna get the screws out of there. You have your choice of hammer and nails, some tape, screws and a screwdriver, or wood glue. Who knows which of those options they would use to join the two pieces of wood together. Great. So for anyone that raised their hand for any of those situations, what I'm interested in is why. Right? There's, there's probably a lot of reasons. You could have a lot of experience. right? Maybe you've used a hammer a lot, and you're like, oh, this is just another tool situation where I can use the hammer. Cool, wonderful. Right? You might just want to get it over with. Right? You look at the tape, and you go, I can just wrap the pieces of wood together and I'm done, I can move on, right? I met the requirement, they're joined. You might be interested in degree of difficulty, right? You see the brick laying there and you could think, I could use a challenge, right? <laughs> Maybe you're interested in something, right? You've never used wood glue before. It seems like a reasonable application. Let's see what all the hubbub's about. Everyone's talking about wood glue, it's the new hot thing, right? <laughs> Or maybe you don't really know why, but you definitely have an opinion. Right? What we're gonna talk about today is how we can develop a system for how we can think about all of these kind of choices that we're making. My name is Kevin Murphy. I work at a software consultancy called the NAR Company. We're in Boston, Massachusetts, and we work really closely with our clients and our partners to make sure that we're making the right technical choice for them, for, given the context of the problem they're trying to solve. So if we try to think of some theoretical backing for how we're gonna make these decisions, um, we can consult the sacred project management texts and you'll see a lot of references to alternatives analysis, which is big words. Um, and they'll propose something called a, a weighted scoring model. So let's build a weighted scoring model today and talk about how we do it. Um, as with any good project management tool, it's just a spreadsheet, it's fine. Um, Start by building up some criteria that are important to making this decision. So for this example, we'll say we care about price and ease of use and compliance with some regulatory body and how fast until I can get it. And I put those on the slide really quickly, but the fact is this can take a whole lot of time just to figure out what's important to you. And that's just step one. Uh, you then need to pit them against each other and say, yeah, these things are important to you, but really how important are they? out of a fixed pool of 100 points, how would you determine which one you really care about? Then to identify what choices you're going to evaluate. Uh, for this example, I'm gonna call them A and B because I'm really good at naming things. So be thankful you're listening to a talk and not reading my code. And once you know which of those options you're going to be looking through, you then need to score them on the different criteria. Right? So I'm gonna say how well uh, a is on price and all the other criteria. And same thing for B. And to wrap up, I can compute a score for each of the alternatives by multiplying the weight by the score for the individual criteria and summing them all up. At the end of the day, I choose the option with the highest score. And we're done, we're gonna do A. Great. So what do we learn here? Why, why is this beneficial? Well, it, it takes some thought, right? We, we gave due consideration to each of the alternatives. Um, we didn't just make it up, right? Uh, we went through some thoughtful process that got us to some end point. It also provides some justification for our decisions. Right? So if our, our boss comes to us and says, hey, why did we choose A? 
Right? We actually have an artifact that we can point to and say, well, the team went through this exercise and at the end of the day, A1 for these reasons. And lastly, most importantly to me, is that it's a huge consensus building opportunity. Right? You're not gonna be building this out by yourself, you're gonna involve all of your project stakeholders. Um, so at the end of the day, everyone's gonna be super aligned on what's important to you and how you're gonna get there. Right? And everyone's gonna be all behind on A, because yeah, I mean, we all came together and that's what, that's what it ended up being. So great. It's not all roses though, right? These things take a lot of time to do. Even just knowing what's important to you, like I said, that it's difficult. There's a lot of unstated assumptions you really need to bear out. And you need to learn a lot about the different things you're gonna choose between and make a decision. To do this right, you need to have perfect knowledge. And that's not reasonable, right? You're gonna be making this choice before you have done anything with A or B, right? You're just figuring out which one should I do. And because of that, these things tend to be a bit rigid and inflexible, right? It takes a lot of time. It's really hard to get right. So you're not likely to iterate on it. You might do it at the beginning of a project at a big kickoff meeting, but you probably won't revisit it. So even with these limitations, that, that doesn't mean that it's not valuable, but it may be a little difficult for us to use on a daily basis. Um, but I'm gonna try to give us some help here. And let's talk about how we can actually do that. So I'm gonna save everyone some time and propose some criteria that we can use and, and punch into our weighted scoring model. And to identify those criteria, we're gonna represent them with the four tools that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. So we're gonna talk about the impact of the choices that we make what costs they introduce, what sort of maintenance activities we need to undertake, and lastly, how each of these options affect consistency. So let's get started. And we'll start at the top with impact, which we of course will represent with a hammer because what tool could be more emblematic of making an impact than a big old hammer? For all of these criteria, we're going to grab a ticket out of our ticketing system and, and implement it all together. And so for the purpose of this presentation, we all need to be working on a, a shared application. And so we're gonna be building a tool that food scientists are going to use to conduct their studies. Uh, the Hormel Corporation is based out of Minneapolis. And for all of you canned meat aficionados, the Spam Museum is south of here in Austin, Minnesota. Um, so if you have some extra time and the means to get down there, check it out. Um, we're gonna build a tool to help those food scientists that are working on Spam make Spam taste even better, if you can even imagine that. They're gonna try, and they need our help building a system to let them keep track of the food tests that they're running. So we're gonna do that today. So our first ticket is that these food scientists need a way to welcome participants after they've enrolled in the, in this, in the study. Okay, we can do that. We'll start with a test. We'll build a system test or a features test. And we'll go to the page where you can enroll as a participant. We'll fill in that form with the information you need. And when you click enroll, we'll make sure that we sent some email off, okay? Now we need to make this actually work. Um, we already have a study participant model, right? This is all existing system. Um, and Rails knows how to save stuff. Um, and Rails also knows when it saves stuff and creates stuff. So let's just hook into an active record lifecycle callback and say, after we've created one of these things, we'll call this deliver welcome mailer method. And what that will do is, as the name implies, We'll call action mailer, it will send itself to it, and it will send that welcome email out to the participant. We're gonna run our test and it passes. So great, we're done, right? We can push it and go grab coffee and go home for the day, play ping pong, whatever it is we do. Right? Maybe, um, but this is a talk about alternatives. It'd be kind of disingenuous for me to just say, there's one way to do this, good job. So let's talk about a, a different way we could solve the same problem. We could instead build a whole separate class. We'll call it a study enrollment. And when you make a new study enrollment, it takes a bunch of parameters about a study participant. And we'll say you can save a study enrollment. And when you do that, it builds a new study participant. And if you successfully save a study participant, it sends the welcome emailer as well. Okay. Get our test to pass, we actually need to change our existing controller a little bit. Before we were creating a study participant, we now need to create an enrollment. We need to save that enrollment. And if it doesn't save, we need to tell the IVAR about what the participant is so we can put whatever form errors it has on there, right? If we do all that, we run our test and it passes. So we've got two things that both work equally well. Right? And now we need to figure out 
which one we're going to do. So let's talk about how impact can help us make that decision. The first thing that's important in impact is to talk about how your team is going to react to these. So uh, presumably you're working on code with other people, and presumably they're all lovely people that have great experiences, and you love working with them, and they probably have opinions. And you might agree with them, you might not, but they're still their opinions. Um, and we're all working on this code base together, and we all need to be comfortable with the work that we're doing. Um, so you may know that some person on your team has had, let's say, deep-seated issues with active record callbacks. Right? Um, or maybe there's someone else that really doesn't like layers of code and figuring out all indirection and where things are coming from and which class to use in which scenario. And if you know that information about your team, that can help sway your decision on how your implementation is going to look. Okay. You also need to consider what sort of standard you're setting. Okay. Any code that you write that ends up getting merged into the mainline branch of your application is going to be used as an example in the future. So when I build the next feature that sends an email as a result of creating some sort of object, I'm probably going to look back at how we did it this time and just do it really similarly. Right? So it's, it's a bit of a lofty concept, but consider what sort of legacy you're leaving by introducing this code. Right? What sort of caveats are there you need to be worried about? Right. Lastly, with impact, you need to consider what sort of non-functional requirements may be associated with this work. Right? So one example of a non-functional requirement might be performance. Um, if you're interested more about performance, hopefully you were here in our last session. Nate Berkefeck gave a great talk about profiling and benchmarking. And if you weren't here, definitely check those out. Check that out when the videos come out. Um, but if performance is particularly important in this particular time, one thing ends up being more performant than the other, that can help sway your decision. Accessibility is another incredibly important non-functional requirement. We want to make sure that we're writing systems that the most of us can use. Um, the rest of this talk, I'll be giving you justifications for saying one thing or another. Um, but I'm going to draw a hard line here. If you have two alternatives and one is more accessible, just pick that one. Um, and if there are trade-offs that you're making, find other ways to mitigate them. So uh, sorry to actually draw a hard line somewhere, but it's just an easy one. So there you go. You can just do the one that's accessible. But like I said, for everything else, we're going we're to talk about different ways to do things. Right? So let's. Let's revisit our second criteria, which is cost, which we'll represent with tape, because tape is relatively abundant. You can find it pretty much anywhere. You can get the job done really quickly. And if you screw it up, you can just remove it and try again. So we'll grab our second ticket. Uh, now we're going to make sure that only principal investigators can create study protocols. These folks have PhDs. They went to college for a million years. And this is their big payoff. Congratulations, you're the only people that can do this. We'll start with a test, as we did in our last exercise. We'll sign in as some non-principal investigator. Uh, we'll then go to the page to try to create a new study protocol. And we'll make sure that we see some message that says, ah, you, sorry, you can't really do this, and you actually get sent to some other page. OK. So now let's actually make this work. Well, we already have a way to create a new study protocol. Um, so we can write an if test that says, if you're a principal investigator, cool, keep going. And if you're not, uh, sorry, uh, but here's this message that says, uh, you can't do that, and you're going to go to some other place. OK. Write our test, and it passes. So once again, we're done, right? No, this is a talk about alternatives. So let's go back to that controller that we had before. Instead, let's pull in some third-party authorization library. And we'll ask it to handle being able to answer the question, can this person do this thing on this resource? Uh, for this example, I'm using Pundit. So a bit of Pundit-specific thing, because I want to do something special here and show a certain flash message. I need to rescue from that particular error and call that flash message. If there are any authorization library authors in the room and I didn't use your authorization tool, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's great. Um, I had to pick one. Um, but we do that, we run our test, and it passes again. Okay, cool. So we can write an if test. We can pull in a third party dependency. How do we know which one to choose? And we're talking about cost, so if Aaron's here, yes, we're going to answer the question. 
We can do these things, but at what cost? So when I'm interested in cost, what I like to talk about is what sort of appetite you have for risk. Any of these solutions are going to introduce some level of risk, and maybe even the same risk, but they'll manifest themselves in different ways. If you pull in a third party dependency, you're accepting any performance problems they might have in their code, any security issues. Um, you're availing yourself to hoping that they will continue to maintain it, or that you can help maintain it, right? that it will continue to be usable. And if you write the code yourself, you still have all those problems, but it's just you trying to fix them all. That doesn't mean it's wrong or bad, they're just different. But you need to go through the exercise of understanding what's important to you and how are you gonna mitigate those risks that you're introducing. You also need to be aware of the context within which you're being asked to solve the problem. So we picked this ticket up and let's say that it was introduced to us in a, in a sprint planning meeting Monday morning. We all sit down with our coffee and our bagel and our, our product manager gets up and says, great news everybody, we got some new work we're working on this week. Uh, only certain people should be able to do certain things in the system. Let's go make sure it happens. And we all high five and go off and do that. I'm sure that's how your Monday mornings go with everyone. But the way I actually solve that problem might be super different if I never actually got this ticket as a ticket, but I got it from someone running at my desk at 4.30 on Friday saying, co-investigators can make study protocols. If we don't fix this right now, we're all fired. Right? Radically different situation. I also have dinner reservations and I'm leaving for the weekend. So I just wanna get this done. The choice that I make is gonna be impacted by the context within which I'm being asked to solve that. And there's a cost associated with that, and that's perfectly fine. We just need to recognize that. We also need to be considered with cost of what the big picture is. Right? So we're working on our one ticket, and we're just making sure that only principal investigators can make study protocols, and that's fine. Um, but even for this one little ticket, we just we guarded on the new action. Um, but we probably want to do the same thing on create. Right? So if someone happens to find a way to post to our form, we don't want to let them create a new study protocol unless they're an investigator. And that's fine. If we're going with the if clause, we can add the if clause in the, the create action too. And, and we can even uh, extract it into a private method in the controller and say, great, it's dry, right? We only did it once, wonderful. And then maybe a couple weeks later, we have to guard some other uh, resource against some other action. And you know, we do a similar thing and we think back and go, oh, hey, we actually, we did a similar thing in, in this other controller. Let's extract it into its own module or class. Awesome, that's super cool. You're now maintaining an authorization library. And maybe you wanna do that, and that's cool, but maybe you don't, and that's fine too. Um, but if you knew how your system was going to change and what sort of risk you're willing to take on at the onset, it might impact which option you choose. This idea of the big picture is gonna come back in our next criteria, which is maintenance. I don't know about you, but I spend every Monday morning walking in, opening up my Rails app, tightening a couple screws, making sure everything's all good to go, and then going about my business. Um, what that actually ends up being for me is updating gems, um, but we're gonna use the screwdriver to represent any maintenance activities we're gonna take on. So we'll grab another ticket, our food scientist friends have the ability to look at the data they're collecting about how much people are loving spam, but for whatever reason, those food scientists can't see when we actually got this data, right? when, when the actual taste test happened. So we, we need to make sure that that's available. All right, we'll write a test yet again, and we'll set some time that this data was collected at, and we'll create a data collection event, and we'll say that the created at timestamp is that time, and we'll go to the show action, and we'll make sure that it spits out that date in whatever format we expect. Okay, so we're gonna go to our show, our show view. We'll have some list that says, hey, here's when this was collected, and then it spits out the, the Rails created at timestamp, and we'll assume that that format is the right format in the test, and it passes. Once again, this is a talk about alternatives. So let's look at a different way we could solve that. And for some inspiration, we're actually gonna change the test a little bit. And this, we had this variable called collected at, and we ended up setting it as an, on an attribute called created at. 
what if instead we had a separate attribute on the model called collected at, and then we just used it there? Okay, we can make that work. We'll add a migration to add the new attribute. And we'll make a subtle change to our view where we were once using the created at timestamp. We'll now use collected at. We can run our spec, and we pass. Okay, so we can use the Rails timestamp, uh, default of the created at time, or we can introduce a whole new attribute. How can maintenance help us solve this problem? Well, the really, to nail maintenance, you need to be able to predict the future. I'm gonna ask you to do that, because I'm not super great at it, but I can just stand up here and tell all of you, hey, just be able to predict the future and then you'll never have a problem with maintenance. But even though I'm not that great at it, to go back to that big picture idea, I still know a little more about my application than just the current problem I'm trying to solve. Right? Maybe I know that we're going to be importing a bunch of data from another system that has uh, food science experiments from the last 15 years. And if I know that, then as part of doing that import, if I'm using the Rails timestamp, that created at time can either represent the time it was entered into the database or the time that the data collection event actually took place, but not both. And that could be a problem. So if I know that, it can help make the choice of, of what I'm doing. But if I know no data is ever gonna come from ever, any other place, or even if I just don't know it's not gonna happen as far as we know, we can get away with just using the Rails timestamp. It could be perfectly fine. <laughs> if you don't have this context yourself, I'm gonna propose a radical idea. Talk to other people about it, but don't do most of the talking. Do a lot of the listening. Particularly talk to folks that aren't doing the same work as you. Talk to developers and other teams. Talk to your users. Talk to your product support folks. Talk to your project management. Talk to your ops team. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you before you make something their problem for the end of time. Right. Talk about what, what they're thinking about when you're saying, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem, right? They might have some context and some information that you aren't even aware about that can radically influence the work that you're doing right now. Lastly, for maintenance, consider ways that you can make things easier on yourself. I'm sure we've all been in situations where we've been working on a code base for a while, trying to implement some new feature. We're looking at some section of the code and something's just not sitting right. We don't really know what's going on with it. So whether it's procrastination or just giving into temptation, we, we get blame the line. Right? And we see it was from a couple months ago and we, yeah, it was a pretty hectic time. And then we realized it was us that wrote that code. And we had no idea. And we just take a deep breath and think, I'm sure I had my reasons. And you're right, you did. Presumably we're all just doing the best we can at the current time. And that's wonderful. When you look back at code that you've written in the past and you think and go, oh, there's no way I would solve that problem this way right now. That's awesome. That's something in the right context to be celebrated. You're learning, you're growing. Maybe there's a design pattern you didn't even know about three months ago when you wrote the code that would radically solve or make this more simple or whatever mechanism, uh, criteria you're interested in, right? But that's actually not what I'm talking about with future self. I'm actually talking about the situations where you're sitting down, you're trying to solve a feature, and you're just like, you know, I just, I need this to be over. And I know I could, you know, take another hour and fix this, that, or the other thing, but it's just, I need to be done with it. And that's fine too, don't get me wrong, that totally has its place, right? It's 4.30 on Friday and you just don't wanna get fired. That's fine. But if you have the opportunity to, to step back a little bit and think about, if I put in just a little bit more effort, how can I make it so that future self doesn't get mad at past self who is currently living in the present? Um, we've got one last criteria to consider. That is consistency. It's the glue that holds everything together. Metaphors are great. So we've got one last ticket we're gonna be working on together. We have a page where some folks can edit some of their personal information. And we're going to continue to allow them to do that, but if they do so, we need to make sure that they're aware they may no longer be eligible to participate in the study. Maybe the folks at Hormel are only interested in people in certain age demographics or that have certain food palates or whatever other things they're interested in, okay? So we'll write a test. It's 
That's the way we've done everything else. We'll go to the page where you can edit your personal information and we'll make sure that there's some message that says, ah, you know, you can totally do this, but there are consequences for your actions. Okay, and we already have an existing controller because we already have the ability to edit personal information. So we'll just add a flash message that, you know, we'll say just, hey, just show this immediately. And as long as that localization shows what's in the test, we're good, right? Once again, everyone say it with me one last time. This is a talk about alternatives. Great job, everybody. Um, subtle twist I'm gonna have on this is, this actually isn't going to propose a new implementation. It's fine, it's a flash message, it's one line. What I'm interested in is do we even need this test? Uh, what, what value does it have? How do I know how to test something? How do I know at the right level to test it? How do I know if I should test something at all? Well, consistency can help you here. Let's look at what sort of institutional knowledge there is in the world. Right? What are the current best practices in the world about testing flash messages? What are the thought leaders thought leadering about, about testing flash messages? Right? What do we care about as an organization about testing flash messages? Right? If you work at a company that has a giant poster on the wall that says, we do not test flash messages, it's probably going to color what your decision. If you also work at that company, come talk to me after, because I have so many questions. <laughs> but if you do work there, probably gonna make your choice for you. The other part of consistency is also being interested in what existing standards already exist. This is the flip side of impact. Remember when I said any work that ends up being merged into the mainline branch of your application is gonna be used as an example? Right? This is the time where I can use that. Right? So if I quickly look through the code base and I, I don't see any tests for flash messages, that's gonna give me some signal. If I see tests that test a bunch of things about flash messages, that'll give me a different signal. And that can help me make my decision. Right? And lastly, with consistency, consider how easy or difficult this is for someone new to be able to understand it or make a change to it. Um, we're here at RailsConf, presumably we'll have a, a bit of Rails knowledge, um, focuses heavy on convention over configuration and there's, there's a Rails way to solve certain problems. Right? And that has immense value. It means that most of us, if not all of us in this room could probably swap Rails apps and pretty quickly have some sense of what's going on some even just small level. That doesn't mean that we should blindly follow the Rails way. There are certainly reasons to deviate from it. Uh, but there's value in solving similar problems in a similar way. If not throughout the industry, even just within your organization. So how can we make sure that we're uh, allowing ourselves to introduce new people to the code base and have them understand what's going on relatively quickly? So we've talked about our four criteria. We've talked about them separately. But annoyingly, we've got to actually think about all of them at once. And we've got to consider how each of them apply in the given situation that we're trying to solve. So even though I would never actually sit down with my team or even by myself and break out a spreadsheet and say, great news everybody, we're building a weighted scoring model I probably have some sense of just working in the team for a while roughly how important these things are. Right? But that's just a baseline, it's a, it's a starting point. Right? These numbers are malleable and need to change as a result of whatever problem you're trying to solve. So let's go back to our ticket because I actually omitted the beginning of it, which is the reason we're doing this is to maintain compliance with some FDA regulation. And for anyone in the audience that actually deals with an application that has FDA regulations, Hold on, don't run out of the room with your laptop screaming, we gotta fix this. I, I made this one up. Um, I'm sure your app is totally compliant and you're good to go. But even just knowing that the reason we're doing this is to meet some sort of regulation with a government body might change our baseline. We now know we have to put together some attestation report for our auditors to make sure that they can understand that what we're doing is still in compliance, right? And we need to definitely make sure that this never breaks. Right? So maybe consistency is less important and impact goes up and the maintenance costs go up. And that's fine. Right? Let's dig a little deeper and look at what this regulation actually says 
And again, for this thing that's made up and doesn't actually exist, I don't even know if the FDA can do this, but let's say they could throw you in jail or cost you a lot of money. And presumably, if you enjoy whatever level of freedom you have right now, um, and you like the company you work for and like, would like it to remain solvent, um, you probably don't want to run afoul of this. Right? So that dramatically changes this criteria, right? Now, I pretty much just care about cost at the cost of everything else. Right? So even if I work at that company that has that poster that says, we do not test flask messages, we test one now, we test this one, because I don't want to go to jail. I'll take that poster down, it's fine. <clears throat> right? But I still care about the impact and I don't want every developer on my team cursing at me saying like, you know, CI times would be five seconds faster if you didn't have that test, that test that flash message. Um, and that's fine. We test drove everything else, so we probably have happy path test coverage for our editing personal information page. So rather than building up a whole new test, I can just hook into that existing spec and say, hey, while you're doing what you're doing, just make sure I don't go to jail, and then keep going, it's fine. Right. So even though, you know, we, we changed our approach a little bit, but we didn't, we didn't break, right? It's still like, this is the most important thing to me, so I'm gonna keep doing this, but I can still find different ways to meet other people's needs. Right. So, next time you're at work, working on your personal project, whatever it is that you're working on, have a problem you're trying to solve, and you know there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. I don't know, they all seem fine. Make sure to consider what sort of impact it has, not only on the code base and your product, but also on your team. What sort of costs it's introducing and how you're going to uh, be aware of them and mitigate them. Understand what sort of maintenance activities you need to undertake as a result of implementing either of these options. And also consider how it affects how consistent this is against uh, the way that you solve similar problems. If you're interested in copies of these slides or to see a full Rails app that has these fully built out, you can either go to the nar.co slash railsconf or visit my GitHub at kevin-jhsm slash evaluating alternatives. I have stickers, they look like this. If you would like to one of them, come talk to me. Otherwise, I'm the only thing standing between you and happy hour. So I'm happy to take questions after the fact down here if you wanna chat. Otherwise, thank you all very much for your time. You're a great audience. I appreciate it.